The sisters, night begot, implacable, terrific furies, sat before the prison portals, adamantine confined, combing black vipers from their horrid hair. Tisiphone, whose locks entangled are not ever smooth, tossed them around, that backward from her face such crawling snakes were thrown. Tisiphone, revengeful, takes a torch, besmeared with blood and vested in a robe dripping with crimson gore and twisting snakes and girdled she departs her dire abode with twitching madness terror fear and woe the fury stands with arms extended and alive with twisting vipers she shakes her hair the moving serpents hiss they cling upon her shoulders and they glide around her temples dart their fangs and vomit corruption plucking from the midst two snakes she hurls them with her pestilential hand upon her victims and with a monstrous composite of foam once gathered from the mouth of kerberos the venom of echidna purposeless abhorrences crimes tears hatred the lust of homicide and the dark vaporings of foolish brains, a liquid poison mixed and mingled with fresh blood in hollow brass and boiled and stirred up with the slip of hemlock. She took it, and as they trembled, threw that mad mixed poison on them, and it scorched their inmost vitals, and she waved her torch repeatedly within a circle's rim and added to the flame. Oh, oh, hi. Hello there. This is Let's Talk About Myths, baby. And I am your host, Liv, who, who still can't quite fathom how incredible Seneca is, despite being a Roman. But I mean, I, I'm here for it all the same. Seneca is so fun. And by fun, I mean violent and gory and horrifying. But that is pretty damned fun when it comes to ancient sources, particularly dur during the spookiest of seasons, and also just for my dark black soul. Now, that quote I read at the top wasn't actually Seneca. I felt like maybe we could just use a refresher on why exactly the Furies are so terrifying. Why this play opening with a cursed ghost and a fury speaking of unimaginable crimes was actually one of the most troubling horrifying, fear-inducing things that one could witness on a stage. So that passage was from Ovid's Metamorphoses, actually, adapted based on some inspiration I found on Theoi.com's page on the appearance of the Furies. Because remember, th these aren't just any goddesses. They aren't just bloodthirsty and perpetually seeking to punish those who commit crimes against family members. They're also... Well, they're writhing with vipers, eh, eh, familiar with all sorts of really troubling poisons, and generally just terrible. And I love them. But of course, today we are concerned with the play that that magnificent fury opened for us last week, Seneca's Thyestes. And gods know I'm going to have way too much to say about this play, so let's not trouble ourselves with much in the way of introductions, <laughs> shall we? Where we last left off of Seneca's Thyestes, the play had opened with the ghost of a cursed and eternally punished Tantalus returned to his family line to watch as shit is about to go down. And it's going to be particularly fucked up because, well, the only other person to open the play is this god's damned fury, this goddess of vengeance who spends the opening act calling for violence and bloodshed and literally every horrifying thing that she can imagine. And then we meet Atreus, brother of Thyestes, son of Pelops, who is hell-bent on exacting revenge on his brother for stealing his throne and his wife. What's the punishment for that, you ask? 
Well, it'd probably be different if a fury didn't have her hand in the family's business, but she does. So the only reasonable revenge is to trick Thyestes into killing and eating his own children. Obviously. So trigger warning for that. This is episode 233. What the goddess of divine retribution wants, the goddess of divine retribution gets. Seneca's Thyestes, part two. What madness pricks you on to shed by turns each other's blood, and by crime to gain the throne? You know not, for high place greedy wherein true kingship lies. A king neither riches makes, nor robes of Tyrian hue, nor crown upon the royal brow, nor doors with gold bright gleaming— a king is he who has laid fear aside and the base longings of an evil heart, whom ambition unrestrained and the fickle favor of the reckless mob move not, neither all the mined treasures of the west nor the golden sands which Tagus sweeps along in his shining bed, nor all the grain trod out on burning Libya's threshing floors, whom no hurtling path of the slanting thunderbolts will shake, nor Eurus harrying the sea, nor wind-swept Adriatic swell, raging with cruel wave, whom no warrior's lance nor bare steel ever mastered who, in safety established, sees all things beneath his feet, goes gladly to meet his fate, nor grieves to die. Those lines, whew, well, we haven't quite gotten there yet. That's the next choral ode. It's just that I really enjoy opening these episodes with as many quotes as I can, because the source material is just, it's so good. <laughs> But before we get to the chorus's thoughts on the crimes of this family, the crimes that are still to be committed, and just what kingship actually means, we have Atreus, working to get himself to the point where he is actually prepared to trick his exiled brother into murdering and eating his own children. Atreus has voiced the thought. That's how we ended last week's episode. He, he has this plan. But he's still got his servant there with him, trying to talk just a little bit of sense into the king. Remember, the servant suggested Atreus just outright kill Thyestes earlier. The, the man isn't against revenge, he just realizes that there's revenge, and then there's what Atreus is planning. And one is far, far worse than the other. Atreus' servant quickly realizes that he's not about to convince Atreus to change his mind. But maybe he can at least try to point out that this plan is, uh, well, it might be a hint difficult to pull off. So the servant asks Atreus how he's going to trick his brother. How is he going to lure him back to the palace so that Atreus could even, you know, get him into a, the position to fall into this plan? They don't exactly have a close relationship. Thyestes isn't just going to wander back and give Atreus a nice brotherly hug. My brother wants the kingdom, is Atreus's reply. The hope that he could gain the throne back from me, take over the ruling of Mycenae like he's always wanted. That would make him brave enough to return, or, or at least brave enough to face seeing his brother again. Of course, there's still some convincing that will need to be done. Thyestes isn't stupid. He, he's not going to just easily trust that Atreus isn't planning to kill him the minute he returns to Mycenae. So Atreus says, quote, I will send my sons to tell their uncle his days of wandering in exile are finally over. And he's certain that even if Thyestes himself isn't sold, if he's still hesitant, his sons, who've spent their lives in exile, they will be tired enough to be convinced. And then they will convince him. His servant tries, at least briefly, to convince Atreus not to involve the children. Not his and not Thyestes's. 
Quote, if you teach them to turn on their uncle, they will turn on their father. Crime often comes back round again to teach its teacher. But no, the children have to be involved. They will be the easiest to use. Besides, Atria says, it's not as though they aren't already bad. The entire family is a lost cause. Quote, the plan you call so wicked, which you think savage, brutal, blasphemous, maybe Thyestes is plotting it already. He determines that he won't tell the children of his plot. He will keep them all innocent of his crimes. He, he's going to keep the children out of it. The, the hatred between brothers, they, they don't need to be involved in that. At least, his own children don't. Agamemnon and Menelaus. They, they don't need to be involved. They don't need to know. Thyestes' children, they're a different story. They're involved, but in a different way. Atreus is once again affected by the curse on his family or the presence of the Fury or uh, some combination of the two. Because for the second time in this play, you can almost see outside machinations taking place. He, he says very clearly that he doesn't want to involve his children, that he wants to keep them innocent of the crimes he's planning, even when he has them going to try to convince Thyestes to come back, he still wants to keep them innocent of the truth behind it. And then, almost immediately, he seems to change his mind. It feels to me that the Fury is, like, taking hold of Atreus here, like she did earlier when he was voicing his need for revenge. Just as she seemed to change his mind from simple revenge, you know, pain or death for Thyestes into something more horrifying than anything seen before in myth, the use of Thyestes' own children, their death and worse, this fury again is shifting Atreus's thoughts on including his own children in the plan. Just moments after he says he won't implicate his own children in his crime, he seems to stop himself. No, he says, quote, if you spare your boys, you will spare his, too. Let Agamemnon be a knowing instrument of my plot. Let Menelaus be conscious of the crime. No, now he wants them in on it. He wants them to be willing participants for somewhat practical reasons, which we will get into. But more than that, I think that it's this suggestion that this, all of this ultimately is happening because it's what the Fury wants. She wants the curse to continue on through this family. She wants Agamemnon and Menelaus to be just as guilty as their father. Because as we well know, this will not be the last time that a fury haunts a member of this family. It's not even the most famous time that furies haunt a member of this family. Atreus goes on to explain that using his own children in this way, giving them this role in the violent and horrific destruction of Thyestes, this active role, will also help him. He'll be able to find out once and for all the paternity of his sons. Are they really his, or did Thyestes take them from him too? He says that his children, if they are actually the blood of Thyestes, ugh, he, they will give themselves away. If they refuse to take part in this plan, then he is certainly their father. Quote, A fearful face often reveals the truth. Large plots betray people against their will. Atreus adds to his servant, very seriously, a warning to keep silent on everything that he's heard. To which the servant tells him that he doesn't even need to be told that. Uh, like, loyalty and fear will keep him silent. He says it leans more towards the loyalty... Somehow I don't believe him. With Atreus' plan solidified and his secret safe with his servant, they both presumably leave the stage. And with that, finally, the chorus speaks up again. But they seem confused. The chorus seems to think that the rivalry between brothers 
has been sorted, that it's been just handled. But if they do, that only adds to the drama for the audience. The audience would be more than aware of what is to come, even if the chorus thinks everything is fine. They open their ode, which is serving as a transition of time in the vein of Greek tragedy, by exclaiming about how happy they are that these brothers have finally sorted out their argument. They go on to speak of what exactly makes a king. It's not wealth or fine clothes. It's not a crown or how much gold you can jam into your palace. Quote, A king is one who can set fear aside, who has no wickedness inside his heart. Chorus, have I got news for you about your king? But they go on. And like in Seneca's Medea, there's absolutely commentary here on the Roman Empire and its methods. I won't pretend like I know exactly what Seneca is getting at here. I don't know his work well enough or his mindset or Rome well enough. But it's very reminiscent of those speeches in Medea, which seem to focus upon all the corners of the Roman Empire. Here, though, the chorus is is commenting on leadership and goodness. They're seeming to suggest that good leadership is a strong mind, bravery, but also the willingness to meet one's fate. That there's no need for arms, for war, no need to destroy cities by siege. So it seems to me there's a bit of criticism on Rome's imperialism here. Because Carthage happened. It's also, I gather, part of Seneca's stoicism coming through. He's a philosopher, after all. But again, that's about the extent of my knowledge on, on the stoicism. And I'd really rather focus on the mythology of it all anyway. The point is simply... The chorus has a whole lot to say about the role of kings, the definition of what makes a good ruler, and their own appreciation for their simple life. They are happy not to be the leaders or kings. Quote, Let my life flow by in silence, unmarked by the people of Rome. When my days have passed in this way without noise, let me grow old, but never rise in class, and let me die. At last I see the welcome dwellings of my fatherland, the wealth of Argolis, and the greatest and best sights to wretched exiles, a stretch of native soil, and my ancestral gods, if after all gods there are. The sacred towers reared by the cyclops in beauty far excelling human effort, the race course thronged with youth, where more than once lifted to fame have I, in my father's chariot, won the palm. Argos will come to meet me, and the thronging populace will come, but surely Atreus too. Rather, seek again your retreats in the forest depths, the impenetrable glades, and life shared with beasts and like to theirs. This gleaming splendor of the throne is naught that should blind my eyes with its false tinsel show. When you look upon the gift, scan well the giver, too. Of late amid such fortune as all count hard, I was brave and joyous, but now... I am returned to fears. My courage falters and eager to go back. I move unwilling feet along. Thyestes has returned to Mycenae and he's got his two sons with him. Those were some of his first lines. When Thyestes returns to Mycenae, Argolis, after so long in exile. He's relieved to be there too. To be home after so long and to have his sons with him there. It's long due, but he's not stupid. For all he's happy to be home, to see the realm that he knows so well, that holds such good childhood memories, he's also worried. He knows how he left things with his brother. He knows that it can't be so simple as just him returning home to a warm welcome. Thyestes, though, isn't there alone? Of course, his his two sons are with him, and they are welcome company. Only one of Thyestes' sons is going to speak in the play. And his name is Tantalus. Yep, Tantalus Jr. 
God damn if that's not exactly what I'm going to call him, because how iconic to name your child after your own grandfather who famously killed your father and fed him to the gods. Like, okay, fine. I know it's just a family tradition to name one's child after yourself or your father, but when your father is Tantalus, like, maybe you just sit that one out. Regardless, his other son, who won't have a speaking line, is named Pleisthenes. According to the older translation I have, too, uh, that I've used for long speeches, there's a third son who's unnamed, but I think it's simpler to just go with the two. There will be a third son eventually, but I don't think he's born yet. So we are concerned with Tantalus Jr. and Pleisthenes. Once Thyestes has hesitated... In his return to Argolis, it has showed that while he's happy to be home, he's weary. He's not ready to trust how things are going to go. Tantalus Jr. speaks up. Why are you so unsure, father? Why are you hesitating? Thyestes responds, but it's almost just himself. He's not really replying to his son. He's just questioning himself aloud. Why am I hesitating? He asks himself, quote, When everything is in doubt, the kingdom and your brother, why would you fear more suffering? He goes on, noting that he should be used to pain by now, used to evil deeds and suffering, but even still, like, maybe I should turn back. Yeah, yeah, I I think I should turn back. Thyeste says, quote, turn back and tear yourself away while you still can. Why are you so afraid, father? Tantalus Jr. asks. You're finally home. Why are you threatening to turn back now? Quote, your brother is no longer angry. He returns and restores to you part of the kingdom. He sets the bones of the broken house and gives you back yourself. And there's our reveal. This, it seems, is what Atreus is using to lure Thyestes back to Mycenae. He's told him that he will share the kingdom, that the two brothers can split the home That's rightfully theirs. That he's no longer angry at Thyestes. He's not holding a grudge. Clearly, Thyestes' children have been sold on this. Exactly as Atreus wanted. And why wouldn't they? We're to gather, at least for now, that it was Agamemnon and Menelaus who carried this news, who came to their uncle and cousins and convinced them that Atreus wanted to reunite with his brother, that it's all water under the bridge, that all is forgiven and they should return home after so long in exile to just take what's rightfully theirs. Ah, so why is Thyestes still so afraid? Even he's not sure, he tells his sons. He he doesn't see any reason to be afraid. He doesn't see anything that he should fear. And yet, he's still scared. He, He says that he wants to keep walking, to fully return home, but that his legs just won't seem to carry him there. There's just, there is something keeping him from following through. Don't worry, father, Tantalus Jr. reassures him. If you can overcome these things that are just only in your mind, this fear that you don't have a reason for, quote, and look to all the prizes you can get if you return back. Father, you can be king. I can, Thyestes concedes, though he's still not certain of anything. Tantalus Jr., though, tries to convince him, and it seems it's not unselfish either, his desire for Thyestes to return and take his place on the soon-to-be-shared throne. He points out that, that his children will inherit it if he takes it back. To which Thyestes says, very simply, quote, The kingdom cannot hold two. Which, gods, that means more than he or anyone else can realize. No, Thyestes, it can't hold to. It can't hold to now, and it can't hold to even in the generation still to come. False, believe me, are the titles that give greatness charm, idle our fears of hardship. While I stood high in power, never did I cease to dread, to fear the very sword upon my thigh. 
Oh, how good it is to stand in no man's road, carefree to eat one's bread on the ground reclining. Crime enters not lowly homes, and in safety is food taken at a slender board. Poison is drunk from cups of gold. I speak that I do know. Evil fortune is to be preferred to good. The lowly citizen fears no house of mine set high and threatening on a mountain top. My towering roofs flash not with gleaming ivory. No guard watches over my slumbers. With no fleet of boats I fish. With no piled breakwater do I drive back the sea. But I am not feared. Safe without weapons is my house and to my small estate great peace is granted. When Tantalus Jr. asks his father how he could consider choosing an unhappy fate when a happy one is within reach, that speech I just read is Tantalus's reply. The cut a bit for time. He's saying that the things that we think are great often are misleading. Those things like, like being a king and ruling a people, all that it comes with, might seem appealing if you've never experienced them, but once you've lived it, those things can lose their luster. They stop seeming so exciting and appealing. Instead, a simple life can be much better than that of a leader. He says that his life in exile might have lacked the glamour and riches of being royalty in Argolis, but it also lacked the fear and anxiety that came with holding the throne, let alone that which came along with the resulting brotherly feud. The way Emily Wilson translates the last line of Thyestes' reply really says it all. Quote, The ability to do without a kingdom is a kingdom. So this Thyestes is really interesting, at least what little we've seen of him up to now. Atreus wanted us, you know, the audience, to believe that Thyestes was the worst man alive, that he is hateful and disgusting, that he deserves the horrific fate that Atreus is planning for him. And when that's all we have about the man, it's easy to believe. But now that we're hearing from him, now that he's rehashing things about his past, thinking about his life so openly, and along with his beloved sons, he he becomes sympathetic. Thyestes seems reasonable. He does not seem so bad. So now we get to wonder, does he deserve it? He Who is really the wronged party here? Obviously, the fate that's planned isn't something that anyone ever could deserve. But aside from that, still, is he so bad? Or is Atreus the one who is either at fault or simply going way, 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 way too far? Or even better, is Atreus that consumed by the will of the Fury that he's just making Thyestes into someone who deserves this? How much of this entire situation is the will of these two brothers, you know, the result of their actions, and how much of it is caused by that goddess of vengeance who called for all of these crimes to be committed because they're fun for her? Regardless of how we feel about Atreus or Thyestes, it's important that we're hearing from his sons, or one of them. Tantalus Jr. has a very obvious purity. He just wants everyone to be back in their homeland and happy together. He he can't see why Thyestes is so worried, so hesitant, when his brother is seeming to be, you know, happy to welcome him home. Even with Thyestes' words about, you know, the weight of ruling a kingdom, the appeal of a simple life... It's just, it's not getting through. A a child who's lived his life in exile when his father once held the throne can't understand that nuance. He, He just sees the black and white. Power and riches are within his father's reach. His brother is offering them to him. Why wouldn't he jump at the chance to have all of that and family back? Thyestes, though, sees beyond it. If Atreus is asking him to rule alongside him, there's more to it. There is a trick of some kind. Definitely. Quote, Could my brother love me? Before that happens, the sea will rise to drench the stars. Black night will light the earth. A loyal pact will sooner join fire to water. Death to life or wind to sea. 
no. Thyestes thinks he does not believe that Atreus suddenly loves him again, that he's suddenly forgiving him for all after all the hatred that he has been harboring for so long. Poor Tantalus Jr., though. He just, he doesn't get it. He doesn't understand why his father is so afraid or or why he's so hesitant to believe his own brother, to trust that his brother has forgiven him and is offering him the kingdom out of love. What are you afraid of? He asks his father. Everything, Thyestes tells him. What isn't there to be afraid of? Atreus holds the power. He adds, though, quote, I fear nothing for myself now, but you, sons, make me fear, Atreus. Ugh, still not understanding, Tantalus Jr. presses his father again, like, why are you so afraid? Quote, when trouble comes, it is too late to be careful. Let it go. But I declare to you, my son, just this one thing. I follow you. It was not my idea. And that is when Atreus returns to the stage and spots his brother and his nephews for the first time. He doesn't go to greet his brother and nephews, though. Not yet. First, he's got a little speech to give. One that he doesn't want his brother to hear. The prey is fast caught in the toils I spread, both the sire himself and, together with the sire, the offspring of his hated race, I see. Now on safe footing does my hatred fare. At last has Thyestes come into my power. He has come, and the whole of him. Scarce can I control my spirit. Scarce does my rage admit restraint. So when the keen Umbrian hounds track out the prey and, held on a long leash with lowered muzzle, snuffs out the trail, while with faint scent he perceives the boar afar, obediently and with silent tongue he scours the field, but when the game is nearer, with his whole strength of neck he struggles, loudly protests against his master's loitering and breaks away from his restraint. When rage scents blood, it cannot be concealed, yet... Let it be concealed. See how his thick hair, all unkempt, covers his woeful face, how foul his beard hangs down. Now let me keep my promise. Diestes, it's so sweet to see my brother again. Give me the embrace that I've longed for. Let all our angry feelings pass away. From this day, let ties of blood and love be cherished and let a cursed hatred vanish from our hearts. Atreus greets his brother Thyestes and Tantalus Jr. and place the knees lovingly. Here's the last line of his greeting in the Emily Wilson translation. Quote, How nice to see my brother come to my arms. I missed you. Whatever quarrels we had are over now. But of course, that is after treated us, the audience, to that long and maniacal speech about the truth of his feelings, his desperate quest for vengeance. That was the speech I just read, ending with Atreus's greeting to Thyestes. His words are fake and forced in either translation. Regardless, Atreus seems to have convinced his brother, at least a little bit, that he really does forgive him, that he really does want their relationship to be mended, for them to forget about all of their past fights, for them to just be brothers again. And Thyestes, uh, Thyestes, when he is met with this behavior of Atreus, when his brother seems to just forgive him lovingly and welcome him back home... That's when Thyestes begins to blame himself. He admits to having done everything Atreus accused him of. He plotted with Atreus' wife, Arope, to steal the golden ram and thus steal the throne for himself. Quote, If you were not like this, I could have refuted all charges. But Atreus, I confess, I committed all the crimes you thought I did. Which again, I just... Is this really something worth the revenge plot that Atreus has in mind? I don't, I don't think that it is. 
All the same, Thyestes doesn't know that his brother is plotting the worst crimes imaginable. He's just sorry. And it makes it all the more heartbreaking. What we do know is coming for him. He says to Atreus, quote, A man who could hurt so good a brother seems a total scoundrel. He, he comes to Atreus as a suppliant, his arms wrapped around his brother's legs in a desperate plea for forgiveness. He's apologizing in the greatest way that he can. And gods, Atreus plays his role well. Looking down at his brother, he tells him, quote, Stop hanging onto my knees. Stand up and come into my arms instead. And then he turns to his nephews, calling them in for a hug as well. A big group family hug after so long apart. Before he tells Thyestes, quote, Be ready to take your share of your brother's kingdom. This is my greatest glory, returning my father's crown to my brother, safe and sound. Atreus is fucked up. This is fucked up. It's so fucked up that Thyestes, who truly keeps seeming more and more sympathetic, tells Atreus that he's so thankful. He, he hoped that Atreus and his family are rewarded for his kindness, but that he doesn't, he doesn't want the crown. Really, that it, quote, would not suit my rough appearance, and my hands are too tainted to take the scepter. I would prefer to be lost in the midst of the crowd. He doesn't even want it. But Atreus can't let that happen. He's got his plan and he's going to follow through with it. I don't imagine he gives any thought to who his m brother might be now, after all this time, whether he might be deserving of just a tiny bit of mercy, or if he does think that even for a moment, we're not seeing it. The Atreus presses Thyestes to take his part of the kingdom that's being offered, even when Thyestes says again that he doesn't want it, that he's going to reject Atreus' offer. He only relents when Atreus says that if Thyestes doesn't take half of the kingdom, he will give up his half, too. And that, of course, isn't what Thyestes wants. It's their family's kingdom. He, he can't let Atreus give it up entirely. So finally, he does accept what Atreus is offering, with one condition. Quote, I will bear the name of kingship, but you will have the law, the army, and myself. Thyestes is just so happy to be welcomed home by his brother after so long in exile and away from his family and their kingdom. He doesn't want power. He just wants to be home. Uh, Seneca, Seneca, Seneca. <laughs> Obviously that end was the quote, right? Just from my older translation. But how are your plays so damn good, Seneca? It, it's so interesting to read, you know, both this and his Medea and like see how they revolve entirely and so specifically like around this, you know, very old and very Greek myth or these two myths. And yet how Seneca manages to infuse his plays with so much Rome. He has so much to say about the empire, imperialism broadly, the actions of the Roman world. And yet this play is still entirely Greek. It is still set there in that, you know, that ancient mythological world, still revolving around a family that is so iconically Greek that the men who are just, you know, children in this play are going to go on to become two of the biggest names in the Trojan War. He even uh, makes me kind of just a little bit like interested in learning more about stoicism because of how it might be into this. Like, and that's a real feat. <laughs> Another line that really stood out to me, though, in Thyestes' speeches is this passing comment he made about whether there are even gods. In his very first speech, talking about returning home to his ancestral gods, he adds a little note, quote, if there are really gods. And Medea said something similar in her play. It reminds me of just, you know, how differently Rome understood their gods compared to the Greeks. Even when those gods often, like, align completely in terms of their characters, like, their religions and practices were very different. 
the Greeks have much more hands-on deities. Like, they're a little more, like, real and practical. Like, beings you could actually encounter rather than, you know, the more conceptual idea of the divine. So that these two people, characters who have and will be so wronged and yet have such strong connections to the divine in their family, that they question whether there are even gods. It just really stands out. If anyone's going to question divinity, or at least like how the divine actually applies to humanity, whether they're even there at all, it would be these two. Because, well, next week, Thyestes' entire life is going to blow up in the most horrific of ways. This is going to make Seneca's Medea look like the story of a happy family. Or at least a family where the dead children don't get eaten. Anyway, happy spooky season. I fucking love coming up with this content in October. It's so fun and dark and fucked up. And if you are listening on Spotify, stay tuned at the end. I've got a poll <laughs> that I came up with at the last minute um, that I just think is like uh, really ridiculous and funny. And I want to hear what you guys have to say about this. <laughs> Okay, as always, let's end with a reading of a five-star review from Apple Podcasts um, because I want to because you guys are so amazing and you leave these for me and I want you to do that more. (laughs) This one comes from a user in the States with a truly delightful username, Monsieur Booya, who's written a truly flattering review. Like this is this is just like everything that my perpetually suffering from imposter syndrome self needed to read and probably needs to read like every day. I might just print it out. Let's talk about live, baby. Liv has developed the preeminent podcast on ancient mythology out there. Her continual self-improvement in spreading awareness of context, translations, and sources combined with her format variety from conversations to direct readings has created a wonderful example of what is possible for other creators. While Liv is focused on Greece, I hope others take up the torch to teach other stories from around the world in such a thoughtful and interesting way. Like, for real. That might be the nicest review like I love I love how much everyone you know says such kind things in these reviews and they all mean the world to me but from a personal perspective of like feeling like I've grown this way and like I'm doing this thing having others say is like really nice okay let's talk about myths babies written and produced by me Liv Albert Michaela Smith is the Hermes to my Olympians she actually got called that recently I did an event uh and somebody called it that and Michaela lost it and it was really entertaining and a true um joy for me she's also the assistant producer the podcast is hosted and monetized by iHeartMedia. listen on spotify or wherever you get your podcasts help me continue bringing you the world of greek mythology and the ancient mediterranean by becoming a patron where you get bonus episodes and more visit patreon.com slash myths baby or click the link in this episode's description i am Liv, and i love this shit honestly like the darker and the more disgusting the better (laughs) 